Hello and welcome to this session, how to choose a software update mechanism for embedded Linux devices. My name is Leon Anavi and I'm a senior software engineer at Kunsuku Group. Kunsuku Group is a services company specializing in embedded Linux and open source software. My colleagues and I have upstream contributions to various popular open source projects, including uh, the Yocto project, Open Embedded, Automotive Grade Linux, the Linux kernel, uh, U-Boot, uh, various uh, open source solutions for software updates and many more. The company provides hardware and software build, design, development and training services. Kunsuku Group is based in San Jose, California with engineering presence worldwide and I'm working remotely from Plovdiv, Bulgaria. In the next uh, about 30 minutes, we'll talk about the following topics related to updating embedded Linux devices. First, we will brainstorm the things to consider when we're picking up a solution. After that, we'll have a look at the common embedded Linux update strategies, and we'll have a look at the overview of the open source solutions available uh, that implement these strategies. Then we'll have some practical examples using the Yocto project and open embedded with several of the solutions for performing updates. And finally, we'll wrap it up with conclusions. So let's get started with the first thing to consider when we're speaking about software updates of embedded devices, the update size. Are there any limitations of the disk space, the storage on the device? Um, several years ago, we were used as engineers that hardware is in general available and that over time, the price of the hardware most probably will go down. Things change completely because right now we are in the middle of a global chip shortage. Uh, it's very hard to find microcontrollers. It's very hard to find uh, memory. It's very hard to, uh, hard to find pretty much any components. So disk space is becoming a real issue. The second question is, are there any limitations of the network bandwidth for the data transfer? This is particularly important if you are working on a solution that relies on mobile data to download the, uh, the artifact to the device. As part of the preparation for, uh, for this um, presentation, I visited cable.co.uk and according to this website, in the US, the average cost for mobile data is 3.33 US dollars per one gigabyte. Of course, if you have a better contract, you may have significantly better rates. But still, if you rely on mobile data to perform updates, this is not for free and there is some cost. The bigger the size of the update is, the greater the cost is. Another thing to consider is how you're going to transfer the data to the device. What are the different ways of transferring updates? Uh, we can do over the air uh, using Wi-Fi or mobile data. We can do it uh, with an Ethernet cable. We can do it even the old fashioned way with a USB stick. Yeah, um, still uh, for some industrial setups when we, where we have machines uh, working together in a local network that's not connected to the internet. Sometimes uh, uh, there is a use case where a technician has to go plug a USB stick and perform the update. And, uh, there are other options to do an update which are less common, but it, 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 could, it could be possible to perform an update over Bluetooth or even um, over serial. So there are a lot of options how to transfer the data and uh, before you choose the solution for, for update of your embedded Linux device, you have to think over what is the exact use case for you, how you're gonna install this. If it's just over the air or Ethernet cable or USB stick or something else. Another thing to consider is how you're gonna manage the devices. Do you need to update a single device or multiple devices? Are all devices using the same software stack? Well, this is um, pretty interesting because sometimes you can have pretty much the same image built for different architectures. Uh, it can be built for x86-64 uh, machine and ARM machine. As a result, you will end up with two different uh, binary images and different binary artifacts for updating these images. Are all devices online all the time? Do you need to monitor the update of the device and get some feedback to see which are the devices are updated? 
do you need to update different devices at different times? This is particularly interesting for consumer products, which are uh, used in diff uh, worldwide in different and used uh, in different time zones. For example, uh, it's, um, it's common that uh, these type of devices are updated at night. However, in different time zones, night is a, a different time. Uh, do you need to, to do something like this and update the, the devices depending on the time zone in which they are? Also, how to update and manage fleet of devices if you have a gazillion of devices. Uh, for example, if there is uh, some kind of an internet of things that you need to update. And uh, all these questions are not only related to, to the embedded device, but also to the back end, to the management system that's performing the update. And um, uh, nowadays, this system could be in the cloud, so we, we might be even talking about web development uh, in this particular um, scenario. The next thing to consider is how are you going to build images? Most probably you have already started building images with some kind of a build system. So what distribution and build system do you use? Is there a board support package for the hardware you use? Is the software update technology compatible with the build system and the BSP? Uh, this, these questions are very important because if there is no support uh, for the solution to perform the update in your build system, this means that you have to spend time and money to integrate it. It's pretty much the same with the board support package. However, uh, most of the open source um, software solutions for performing updates already have uh, integrations with a lot of um, hardware. So uh, in, even if you need to do some kind of an integration of the BSP, it's significantly easier compared to integrating the whole uh, software over the air um, uh, solution in a build system if it's not already integrated there. And speaking about build systems, uh, what are the options out there? Uh, here is a list of the, in my opinion, popular open source build systems for custom embedded uh, Linux distributions. We're starting with Yocto Project and Open Embedded. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to lie to you. This is my preferred choice and I'm using it, using it on a daily basis. Buildroot is another excellent build, uh, build system. I have upstream contributions to Buildroot as well. PDXDist is an alternative. OpenWRT is something designed primary for uh, building images for uh, wireless routers, but it can be adjusted for embedded devices as well. And there are other options uh, as build systems on the market too. A common question is, can I just use Debian? <laughs> uh, it could be Debian, OpenSUSE, Fedora, IoT, whatever. Uh, we're talking here about uh, desktop distributions. And uh, yes, you can use, use it. Debian is a stable, full distribution with tens of thousands of packages available as binary files for installation without the need to cross compile from source. And this is actually an advantage because you don't have to spend time to cross compile um, a package each time they're already compiled for, for the uh, ARM and the x86-64 architectures. There are numerous Debian derivatives uh, for embedded devices. Um, some examples are the Raspberry Pi OS and Armbian. The problem with, with Debian is, or other desktop distributions is that you need to uh, modify them in order to fit uh, on the embedded device. And um, if you decide to update it using the package manager, uh, this means that most probably you need to update not only the package you are interested in, but also its dependencies. And if you remember from the late 90s and the beginning of this century, um, you may run into the so-called dependency hell working with the um, package manager. So, Although I use Debian derivatives for some hobby projects at home, I highly don't recommend you to go this way if you're working on a professional device. And I recommend you to use a dedicated build system. This is a very wide and wild topic. And Chris Simmons had an excellent um, presentation on this topic a couple of years ago. Uh, so here is a link in uh, YouTube 
If you have missed it, have a look at it. So now I would like to focus on the Yocto project. Um, this is something that we'll be using uh, uh, in the next slides for the examples. So the Yocto project is an open source collaborative project of the Linux Foundation for creating custom Linux based systems for embedded devices using the Open Embedded Build System. Open Embedded Build System includes two things, BitBake and Open Embedded Core. The Yocto project comes with a reference distribution called Pocky. It's provided as metadata without any binary files so that you can bootstrap your own distribution for embedded devices pretty quickly. The Yocto project has biannual release cycle, which means that we have two releases each year. And now there is a long-term support release covering at least two year period. So if you are working on a long-term project or, uh, on which the research and development will take more than six months, I highly recommend you to pick up um, long-term support release of the Yocto project. Now, let's talk about the strategies for updating embedded Linux devices. Basically, there are three stra main strategies. A, B updates, where we have dual redundant scheme, basically two identical partitions. We have delta updates. Uh, in this case, we the updated artifact is just a small chunk of binary data, which is the difference between the old and the new image. We have container-based updates. Uh, in this approach, we're bringing containers, which are um, um, a household name nowadays for cloud applications to embedded devices. And sometimes where there are more sophisticated use cases, uh, you may need to combine several of these strat strategies together. Now let's have a closer look and um, this, um, discuss the details of each of these strategies, starting with the AB updates. So we have dual AB identical root file system partitions. There is also a um, uh, data partition for story, storing any persistent data which is left unchanged during the update process. Typically, a client application runs on the embedded device and periodically connects to a server to check if there is an update. So if a new software update is available, the client application should download it and install it on uh, the other partition and after that switch to it by rebooting the system. Uh, there is a fallback in case of update failure because you, we always have another partition that is known to work, a good partition that we can switch to. The next strategy is the so-called delta updates. In this approach, only the binary delta between the difference of the new and the old image is sent to the embedded device. Basically, it works in a Git-like model for file system trees. This way, we save storage space and furthermore, we save connection bandwidth because the delta updates are significantly smaller uh, compared to the artifacts needed to be downloaded and installed with the previous strategy, the AB updates. It's also possible to roll back the system to a previous state. Now let's compare the AB updates with the Delta updates in general in terms of strategy. We're not speaking here about a specific implementation of these strategies. We are speaking in general because there are certain rules that are applied no matter how you implement this strategy. So AB updates obviously require a larger storage space because we have two identical partitions for the root FS. For the, for the delta updates, the storage, uh, the storage space is significantly smaller. The same is valid for the update size. For the delta, update, uh, for the delta updates, the uh, the update artifact is small because it's a binary diff only uh, uh, of the changes between the, the new and the old image. And for the AB update, the update artifact is actually something that we're going to install on the other partition. Both uh, the AB updates and the delta updates support rollback to a previous stage. However, the advantage of the AB updates is that it is possible to do a fallback to a backup image on the separate partition. Uh, this is a huge advantage in terms of reliability because all the time we have 
a separate partition on which we can um, uh, we can boot a known to work uh, to be working image. Now uh, another strategy is uh, using containers. Uh, con the container technology has changed the way application developers interact with the cloud and some of the good practices are nowadays applied to the development workflow for embedded Linux devices and Internet of Things. Containers make applications faster to deploy, easier to update and more secure through isolation. And in terms of the Yocto project and Open Embedded, uh, layer meta virtualization provides support for building SAN, KVM, Libverti, Docker, and associated packages ne necessary to uh, construct your own Open Embedded based virtualized um, operating system. Um, so, uh, there are particular solutions for software uh, over the air updates that are entirely focused on containers such as Balena, but it's also possible to combine containers um, with some AB updates or Delta updates. And in, in the ecosystem of Yocto project and open embedded, this can be done with layer meta virtualization. And speaking about uh, combined strategy, this is something um, kind of a hot topic nowadays because multiple combinations exist uh, for more complicated use cases. For example, we can have AB updates with Delta updates. Uh, this way, uh, all the time we have a second partition that is known to work and we can switch to it. Uh, another example for a combination is to combine containers with, let's say, AB updates for the base custom embedded Linux distribution. The advantage of this approach is that we can have a really small uh, embedded Linux distribution uh, capable of running containers and all the apps can be um, uh, can be running in uh, in the containers. This is an um, interesting approach which um, sometimes is uh, preferred by application developers because this means that application developers can isolate their apps in containers, do all the QA there and uh, ensure that the applications are working exactly the way they want them to work. Now let's have a look at the popular open source solution for updates. So far we've covered um, all the uh, things that we need to consider. We covered the strategies for software over the year updates and here are actually the open source solutions to do updates. Uh, we're starting with um, uh, solutions for AB updates such as RAUC, SW update, Mender, S SW UPD. Actually, Mender is capable of uh, uh, doing some advanced features such as Delta updates as well, but uh, the, the main open source feature is AB updates. We have um, uh, solutions based on containers such as Balena and Snap. And um, on the second column, we have uh, solutions based primarily on LibOS3, also known, known as OS3, which implement Delta updates. Um, in order to do it, uh, LibOS3 is not enough because we need a second application that acts as a client to, to check with the server to see if there is an update pending to be installed. Therefore, we have applications such as Actualizer, Actualizer Lite, uh, Qt OTA is based on uh, LibOS3 as well, uh, Toradex Horizon is also based on LibOS3. We have a full meta update as well. And um, RPM OS3, which is used uh, in Project Atomic, also based in LibOS3. Now, let's start um, with a deep dive into three of these technologies, with which I have personal experience with. Mender is available as a free and open source or paid commercial uh, for enterprise plans. Basically, Mender is doing AB updates here for open source and O plus, um, uh, uh, as well as Delta updates for professional and enterprise uh, plans. Mender also provides backend services. This is the so called hosted, uh, hosted Mender. So basically, Mender is end to end update where you have a solution for the embedded device as well as a solution. For, um, for the backend for the server, uh, where you can see all the devices and you can manage the devices. Furthermore, Mender has some interesting add-ons. Mender is written in Go, Python, and JavaScript, depending on which component of the system we're talking about. There is a Yocto and Open Embedded integration through 
the layer MetaMender and extra BSP layers known as MetaMender community. The source code of Mender is available in GitHub under Apache 2.0 license. Now let's have a look at the supported devices by Mender. Um, they cover Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, Intel x86-64 machines, Rockchip, Owinner, NXP, which both includes IMX6 and IMX8, and many more, which are uh, the full list is available in MetaMender community layer. So here is, um, here is actually a screenshot where you can see um, a lot of the machines that are supported. Also, uh, there is support for Tegra devices, NVIDIA Tegra devices. Now, the second thing that we would uh, like to focus on is RAUC. RAUC is a lightweight update client that runs on an embedded Linux device and reliably controls the procedure of updating the device with a new firmware version. It supports multiple update scenarios and also provides tools uh, for the build system to create, inspect, and modify the update bundles. It uses uh, cryptography to sign the update bundles and it's, update, uh, it's compatible with the Yocto project, PDX Dix, and build root. So basically it's compatible with these three uh, build systems. Uh, the source code is again available in uh, GitHub. Here are the licenses. Uh, these are the RAUC integration steps. I have done previously um, talks dedicated entirely on RAUC where I uh, explain in more details these integration steps, but basically we need to select a bootloader to enable SquashFS. Uh, the root file system must be X, X4, and we have to create a identical partition for the root FS that uh, matches the RAUC slots. Uh, to configure the bootloader, some other configurations. So here is an, an example where we have A and B partition, actually three examples, three different examples. In all of them, we have A and B partitions. The difference is how we handle the data partition. The data partition is the information that um, is persistent during the update. Uh, it, there are three different configurations uh, that we can make with Frog for the data partition. This is one of the advantages compared to other solutions, pretty flexible in terms of the data partition. Um, in 2020, I started a, a Yocto layer called MetaRAW Community. Basically, this is uh, a layer that provides examples how to integrate um, RAW on several machines. At the moment, it supports x86-64, Quemo, Raspberry Pi, true Meta Raspberry Pi layer, uh, Sungsi, oh, these are the all winner devices through Meta Sungsi, NVIDIA Jetson TX2 through the Meta Tegra BSP layer. Uh, contributions are always welcome, so if you have uh, experience with RAUC running on another hardware, de uh, hardware device and you would like to contribute to Meta RAUC community, please do it. So here is an example how you can um, integrate um, integrate uh, uh, RAUC with uh, Yocto and Open Embedded with Meta Raspberry Pi for Raspberry Pi. This is based on the long-term support release of, um, um, of the Yocto project called Dunfo. Uh, these are the configurations that has to be set in loco.conf. After that, we need to build the system. And while it's once it's built, here is how it works. I'm just starting a, a simple web server uh, and on, on the build machine and uh, in this scenario, I suppose that the build machine and the Raspberry Pi 4 are in the same local network. After that, on the Raspberry Pi 4, I have to log in and to download the um, RAUC artifact, to manually download the RAUC artifact. Uh, and after downloading it, I need to install it. In order to for the new uh, version to take effect, I need to, uh, to do a reboot. And on a reboot, the bootloader switches, switches to the second partition on which I have downloaded and installed the RAUC binary. As you can see, all these steps here in this example are done manually, and it is possible to do them automatically using uh, configuration, uh, uh, configuration and management system, for example, Eclipse Hawk bit. This is a domain-independent backend framework for rolling out software updates to constrained edge devices as well as more powerful controllers and gateways connected to IP-based network infrastructure. It's written in Java, it's available in GitHub under EPL uh, 1.0 license, and it's compatible with RAUG and SW update. So unlike 
Mender, where we have an end-to-end -end solution that includes both the uh, web interface for managing the updates. In, um, uh, in the case of RAUC and SW update, we don't have this, but with a third-party tool such as Eclipse Hawkbit, we can uh, have the same result for AB updates. Uh, so, in terms of uh, speaking about switching back to Mender, uh, you can see that the uh, standard is installation in, a, in, a, uh, in the standalone uh, version is pretty much the same approach as the approach we did with Rauk. Again, I'm building, um, building an image, I have to disable uh, the uh, system disservice that automatically st uh, starts the Mender client and then to run an um, uh, HTTP server on the build machine and on the embedded device in which we have Mender to install it manually. This is the standalone, uh, the, the standalone version. However, it's highly recommended to use the manage, the default approach where a client is running all the time as a daemon and pulls from the server updates. And once again, I repeat that Mender also provides a server so that you can, um, you can manage um, the devices on which you're performing updates. Now, uh, the Mender data partition, Mender creates a data partition to store persistent data, which is preserved uh, during the update. It supports uh, X4, ButterFS, and recently I added support for F2FS file systems. Um, the, the Mender client actually uses the, the, uh, the data partition to preserve data uh, that is using uh, and um, uh, information about the updates. There is a variable called Mender Data Part Size MB uh, for Yocto and Open Embedded Builds, which configures the size of the data partition. By default, it's 128 megabytes. Uh, but if system D is enabled, Mender GrowFS Data Service will um, will be responsible uh, to uh, with the feature Mender GrowFS Data. The, uh, the system, the uh, GrowFS service will be responsible to resize to the uh, whole available space. It's also uh, possible to implement an uh, initramfs disk to, uh, to modify the, the data partition size. Uh, also, another thing that's possible with Mender is to create an image for the data partition in, adv in advance when we are using Bitbake. Uh, this is particularly convenient if we need to put uh, certain files in the data partition um, on first boot on, on with the installation. Uh, here are the steps uh, how to install Mender. They're pretty, uh, in terms of AB updates, they're pretty much similar in general as with RAUC. We have to apply the update, reboot the device on the first boot. After a successful update uh, through the Mender client, a, com a commit must be performed to accept the update. Uh, by accepting this, uh, by committing this update, the user accepts that everything works fine and on the next boot, the same image will be used. Otherwise, if commit is not performed, the system will roll back on the next reboot and use uh, the old partition before applying the update. So the, the changes uh, won't be available. Uh, furthermore, there are some advanced features for Mender, which are um, uh, worth mentioning. Uh, Mender single file artifact. This means that you can deploy a single file, and this is a solution if you um, if you are using mobile data because a single file can be really small. For example, just the, if you're missing just some kind of a configuration or you need to make a modification of configuration. Here is the Mender single file artifact option. There are add-ons uh, in Mender which makes things uh, really interesting and more convenient for debugging and development and QA. Uh, such a, the features are remote terminal, which is an inter interactive shell session with full terminal em emulation, file transfer. This means that you can uh, upload and download files to and from an embedded device, port forwarding, and also um, a module for uh, an add-on module for configuring, apply configurations to your device uh, through uh, uh, uniform interface. Uh, Mender supports x86-64 uh, devices. This was added through Grub four years ago. Um, and uh, initial installation of the distribution is most commonly done using a live image on a USB stick. So basically the first time when you install the device, you use a USB stick. And after that, uh, you can perform updates over the air. One of the interesting features in Mender is the data updates. So 
at the beginning of the slides, I told you that Mender is known as a uh, solution for AB updates. That's totally true. And the open source version of, of Mender does AB updates, but also Mender offers, offers a robust Delta update root FS as a module for the commercial Mender plan. This is a closer impl cross source implementation. Uh, even with the Delta update uh, reboot is required. It supports rollback. Uh, Mender provides uh, a tool called Mender binary Delta uh, to create um, the binary diff by comparing two different uh, Mender artifacts. A mandatory requirement uh, to use this uh, Delta feature with Mender is to implement a read-only root FS. And uh, how you can do this with Yocto and Open Embedded? Well, in theory, it's pretty easy uh, because it's just a single, uh, it's a single line either in the image recipe or in loco.conf, you have to add the feature read only root FS. Uh, Yocto and Open Embedded will take care for the rest, but beware that you should uh, make sure that all your applications can run in a read only mode. And if there is something that you need to write through these applications that should stay persistent through updates and reboots, you should configure the applications to write it to the data partition. Uh, we can uh, combine AB updates with containers through Yocto and Open Embedded Layer Meta Virtualization. It provides support for building uh, popular container solutions. Uh, virtualization has to be added to the distro features uh, uh, through Bitbag using distro features append. Uh, by the way, this is the new syntax in the previous examples, uh, which were based uh, on release dump out of the Yocto project I was using the old syntax. Um, for example, adding Docker uh, to embedded Linux distribution is uh, uh, pretty easy because all you need to do once you have the distro feature meta virtualization is in place is to add image, install and append. And there are use cases on powerful embedded devices where con uh, containers are combined with AB updates uh, of the base Linux distribution built with Yocto and Open Embedded, for example, with Trauk or Mender. Now let's talk about something else, about um, open source solutions uh, for Delta updates, starting with libos3. libos3, previously known as os3, is a shared library and tools for this, uh, um, uh, distributing and deploying file system images as atomic upgrades for the whole file system tree. It provides a suite of command line tools that combine a Git-like model for uh, committing and downloading bootable uh, file system trees along with a layer for deploying them and managing the bootloader configuration. Uh, libos3, uh, also known as uh, previously as os3, is very effective in terms of disk space and connection bandwidth. It supports rollback of the system to a previous state and it is the core of several solutions for embedded um, uh, embedded Linux distributions such as Toradex Horizon, Actualizer, uh, which was implemented in Yocto and Open Embedded Layer Meta Updater, and Act Actualizer Lite, also queued uh, over, uh, over the air. Um, in order to implement uh, libos 3 it's not very trivial, I have done that in, in the past. Uh, libos 3 encourages systems to implement the user move. Um, it comes with an optional drug cut and system D integration. The documentation explains how to do, to do this. libos 3 only preserves the var directory across upgrades. And uh, var is empty by default and the operating system needs to dy dynamically create the target of uh, these at boot, for example, with systemd um, uh, temp files, if systemd is being used for the particular uh, embedded Linux distribution, of course. Now, um, I would like to mention Actualizer and Actualizer Lite. Um, as part of my job at Kunsuku Group, um, our company was under a contract with ATS Advanced Telematic Systems uh, and for several years we were involved and I personally was involved in the development of Actualizer. This is a C++ application that implements the client-side functionality for OTA Connect according to the Uptain Security Framework. Uh, there, was, uh, there is a um, uh, Yocto and Open Embedded layer called Meta updater, which provides um, uh, all the, the uh, actualizer and uh, all related dependencies for it. 
Um, <clears throat> also, there is a lib actualizer, which is uh, a library providing AP calls to perform various steps that are necessary for checking updates, validating uh, the, the downloads files, and so on. All this is available in uh, GitHub. Uh, actualizer was initially developed by ATS Advanced Telematic Systems. Later on, they were acquired by here. Uh, and um, unfortunately, at some moment, uh, the, uh, the active development of Actualizer uh, and Meta Updater stopped. However, the community and other um, companies and individuals interested in uh, Delta updates um, stepped in, and there are a lot of um, other solutions and modifications, such as Actualizer uh, Lite. Uh, this is something developed by found, uh, Foundress IO, and it's a C++ implementation of TUF OTA update client based on Actualizer, but without the complexity of Obtain. And uh, the uh, Yocto and Open Embedded integration for these solutions are available with Meta Updater for Actualizer and uh, Meta uh, LMP, which brings uh, the necessary um, changes uh, for actualizer light so let's wrap this um, wrap up this presentation with some conclusions uh, as you have seen there are numerous things to consider uh, when implementing an upgrade mechanism for an embedded linux device uh, you have to um, carefully think over all the questions that we started with and to see your device and your if your device and your use case fit into them uh, based on, on this, you can select from the many reliable open source software solutions to upgrade embedded Linux devices. Basically, I have shown you that there are three main strategies and a fourth strategy is to combine them. So based on your use cases, you have to first to select a strategy, then to select a reliable open source solution. Um, there is no um, um, universal answer. So if someone expects me to say, use this or that, it all depends on your, on your use case. Uh, of course, there are certain solutions that are more like turnkey solutions, for example, Mender, because it's, it provides a full end-to-end -end update solution. However, still you may need to combine it with something. And uh, an example for this is to combine an update strategy such as AB upgrades of the base distribution with containers for the application. Uh, for the applications. This is uh, increasingly popular nowadays because of the increasing popularity uh, of containers in, uh, in general. Um, the update process implements, uh, implementation depends on the build system and the bootloader, basically the board support package. Often real-world uh, solution required a persistent data partition which is left unchanged during the update process because basically you need to um, you need to save some configurations over update some configurations that make this particular device unique. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Here are some useful links and I would like to uh, hear your questions. Thank you very much again.